Well, the idea of redesigning the body is is um, is something that's come out from the perceived inadequacies um, in interacting with technology. So, um, for me, it's not an issue of utilitarian improvement of the body, but rather uh, exploring alternate anatomical architectures. It's not about any eugenic concerns or improvements of the body as such, but rather experimenting and exploring with different ways of, of um, operating and becoming aware in the world. Well, I think um, the Third Hand Project, for example, initially made me consider the possibilities of uh, having an additional limb, um, doing things like writing and drawing with three hands simultaneously. Um, so it was really about aesthetic and performative concerns rather than utilitarian ones. Well, well I think we're, we're expected to increasingly perform in mixed realities. So sometimes we, we're, we're biological bodies, uh, sometimes we're machinically augmented and accelerated, and other times we have to manage data streams in virtual systems. So uh, we have to seamlessly slide between these three sort of modes of operation and engineering uh, new interfaces, more intimate interfaces, so we can do this more seamlessly, um, is an important strategy. Well, I think augmented reality is, is certainly a, uh, an important uh, interface with technology because uh, you're generating new layers of meaning um, in your normal perception of the world. Um, you're superimposing bits of information uh, and uh, and possible virtual and possibly virtual images to heighten your experience of the world and to make it more an informed experience. Well, I think increasingly the technology is becoming micro-miniaturised and also biocompatible. So one can, um, one can see that perhaps these bits of technology will be um, implanted in the body. Uh, they'll become sort of plugged directly into our, our nervous systems rather than being objects that we carry around uh, externally to us and I think this um, this insertion of these technologies into the body uh, will result in a in a much more potent subjective ex experience well I, th I think a, lo a lot of uh, a lot of these uh, implants and interfaces are now happening for some medical necessity um, but increasingly uh, there's the possibility that one might enhance the human body through more direct connectivity um, and so I mean at, at the moment we're living in an age of, of, of body hacking of, of, of gene mapping and soon neural jacking uh, and these possibilities uh, will prosthetically augment and, and, and amplify our sensory and also our, our cognitive experience of the world. Well, I think the, the Ear on the Arm project is, is, is a project that explores the, the possibilities of constructing an extra ear, uh, not so much for hearing, but rather to see it as a transmitting organ. So this ear on my arm is not for the artist to, to, to hear better with because the artist already has sort of two good ears, um, but it's really for people in other places to, uh, uh, 
to allow them to to remotely access the ear and remotely listen in to what the ear is hearing. Um, so we've sort of replicated a bodily structure, we've relocated it to the arm and now we're sort of rewiring it for additional capabilities. Um, so one could imagine that uh, uh, bodies becoming increasingly accessible as, 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 as portals on the internet. So for example, I might be able to see with your eyes, if you're in London, listen to someone else uh, who is in Montreal. Uh, someone in Tokyo might remotely activate my, my arm to perform a, an action here in Melbourne. So the body experiences a much more distributed agency and its sensory experience of the world is not limited to this particular location. So uh, I think that's certainly possible and um, in fact I'm already planning a performance where um, these experiments will, 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 uh, will be realised. Well, the first things I, I, I constructed in art school were helmets and goggles that altered your binocular perception and an immersive uh, electronic environment uh, which rotated around the, the viewer. So um, I was never satisfied with traditional art media and became excited about the new possibilities that technological media provide because with every new technology there's unexpected information and images that it generates and so to use technology as a new medium of, of, of artistic expression becomes very important. I, I was always interested in, in uh, comparative anatomies and, 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 and evolutionary sort of architectures. Um, and also interested in how the body might perform um, using its own experience and being able to express itself better through, through its, its, its body. Uh, so there's always been an interest in, 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 in those areas and, and um, I've always been fascinated by insect locomotion, by animal perception. Uh, we, we know that, that uh, these different anatomical architectures operate and, and become aware in the world in, in, in very different ways. Um, and so this human body should, should not be seen as a biological given, uh, but rather uh, this body is as contingent as anything else uh, that, that we do. Um, we should be able to choose how we redesign our human bodies. Um, I wrote a text early, uh, very early on, um, evolution by the individual, for the individual. Uh, so this idea of body hacking should be uh, uh, an issue of, of, in, of individual choice rather than some kind of social, social engineering. I mean, I also mentioned the idea that uh, the artist of the future should should um, should be uh, a genetic sculptor. The idea that um, you know artists will increasingly um, use biotechnologies, biotech tissue engineering. Um, I mean, for me at the moment, uh, what. Uh, what would really make bioart a more potent interrogation of what it means to be human and what it means to have a body is if we could uh, stem cell grow or bioprint a teratoma-like lump of living tissue which would be slimy to the touch, which would have um, orifices that sigh, which would have you know, teeth and hair, but this teratoma-like 
sculptural object um, would be a much more interesting uh, example of bio-art than, than what we've seen up until now. I've known Kevin, uh, Kevin Warwick for a number of years and in fact we were part of a conference called Virtual Futures uh, just a, a month or so ago and uh, Kevin did invite me to Reading to kind of brainstorm together so I'll probably be doing that the next time I'm in the UK but um, yeah I think a lot of Kevin's ideas are interesting and uh, what's unique about his approach is he's willing to experiment on, on himself. Well the, the body here is, is a kind of a convenient site for experimentation. Um, by this I'm not talking in a Cartesian way. If I want a sculpture inside my body, um, to do this uh, to myself, there's not a problem with ethics, there's not a, a problem with gender politics. If I want to insert a sculpture into someone else's body, uh, then there's all sorts of difficulties. There's, there's safety concerns, there's uh, ethical issues, so uh, it's just been convenient to suspend this body, to uh, get this body to move involuntarily with muscle stimulation systems, uh, to consider works of art inserted or implanted into this body. Um, Blender was a, a project uh, that was very different in collaboration with another artist, Nina Sellers. We underwent surgical procedures to extract about 4.6 litres of biomaterial from each artist's body. Um, this, was, uh, uh, this material was inserted in, a, in an installation titled Blender um, with four bottles of compressed air. Once every five minutes the compressed air would actuate the Blender blades, uh, mixing the biomaterial from two artists' bodies. So, this is the kind of inverse of the stomach sculpture. Instead of having a, a robotic machine inside a, a soft part of your body uh, uh, performing some action, uh, here we have a, in Blender a machine installation that becomes a host for a liquid body composed of biomaterial from two artists' bodies. So this was a kind of... Um, body construct which uh, was an unexpected one and one that considered uh, machines becoming hosts for uh, uh, a, a, a liquid body. So Virtual Futures which was uh, held a, a couple of months ago in the UK, revisited the original uh, Virtual Futures uh, conferences uh, at the University of Warwick in Coventry, uh, originally organised by people like Nick Land and, and Sadie Plant. And unfortunately they couldn't be at this, uh, at this recent conference, but uh, some of the original participants were able to uh, to do presentations and it was fascinating to see in fact how they progressed in their ideas and and um, how the the, the the different possibilities of of uh, of these contestable futures were, were, were presented. I guess I've always been uneasy about uh, being categorised, um, um, you know, as a transhumanist or as a posthumanist. Or, I mean, for me, these are, are somewhat arbitrary, um, arbitrary categories that uh, allow people to kind of comprehend what's going on. But for the artist, uh, it's they're not important. Um, I think the, the artwork speaks for itself. 
I've performed with a third hand, an extended arm, a virtual arm, a six-legged walking robot. Um, we're surgically constructing and stem cell growing an ear on my arm. Uh, a new project is this um, external soft musculature for the body which extends the arms to primate proportions. Uh, at the end of each arm will be uh, an ambidextrously designed hand. So if you uh, swivel your, your thumb one way and, and bend the fingers in, that's a left hand, but the thumb can swivel the other way, the, the fingers are double jointed. So you can have a left hand and a right hand all in one. Um, there'll also be an eye in hand webcam so when you're performing with these uh, ambidextrous hands you'll get some interesting uh, vision um, and whilst the artist can uh, actuate his ambidextrous hands uh, with his own agency in fact his arms will be uh, driven by data streams from the internet so my arms will be involuntary, my ambidextrous hands will be actuated with my, with my uh, own agency um, and this kind of cyborgian construct will be one that functions not uh, within the local space that it occupies or even within the boundaries of its own skin but rather performs with distributed agency, uh, remotely accessed and remotely prompted. Um, so I'm not so concerned about categories and their meanings, but rather uh, that the ideas that I'm speaking about are actuated or authenticated by the performances and the projects that I've done. Well, I think there'll be a, a multiplicity of, of, um, of strategies that, that unfold in the near future. Um, so, for example, the sort of Japanese manga, massively augmented exoskeleton uh, body. Uh, this is one possibility, you know. Um, another unexpected possibility is that because machines have become micro-miniaturized because now we, we conceive of, of, of nano-robots and nano-sensors, then we in fact might look the same. We'll look no different than we are in a couple of thousand years. But all the technology will be invisible because it'll be inside the human body. This is totally unexpected. So instead of considering technology as external to the body, uh, as, as extending and massively augmenting it, uh, we can conceive now that in fact our human bodies might look the same, except that they're now recolonized by nanobots and nanosensors. And in fact, we probably need more surveillance inside the human body because we don't have adequate sensing systems at a cellular level to indicate any pathological changes of condition. Uh, and by the time the symptoms surface, it's too late. So uh, engineering uh, uh, um, an internal, an adequate internal surveillance system, I think, becomes very, very important. Of course, the, the realm of the post-human may, may, may not reside anymore with bodies and machines, but in fact, rather with uh, intelligent autonomous avatars or viral entities on the internet. So, um, you know, uh, machines and bodies are somewhat ponderous. They have to perform in gravity. They, 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 uh, with very slow metabolisms. Uh, I mean, bodies and machines uh, uh, don't achieve much in, in short amount, amount, amounts of time. Um, on the other hand, uh, a viral entity, uh, an avatar, uh, performs with the speed of light. 
in electronic media or close to it. Um, avatars can replicate and transmit and proliferate um, and perform with, with much faster speeds. Um, avatars have no organs. Technology has never been the kind of alien other. You know, what's uh, determined our humanity has been the trajectory of our technologies. So uh, what makes the situation different in the future is that uh, uh, technology can be incorporated into the body itself. So technology no longer contains the body but rather becomes a component of our bodies. So certainly this is one sort of contestable future, one possible direction we can go in. Of course there'll be machines uh, that become uh, a kind of life form in themselves. Um, there'll be uh, artificial entities on the internet that for all intents and purposes will exhibit enough qualities of, 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 of life that uh, makes them operate and makes them aware. So notions of artificial intelligence and artificial life um, are certainly already unfolding. So uh, I think uh, symbiosis is, is one trajectory. Uh, the possibility of human-machine chimeras, certainly, um, but also the possibility that um, the body uh, uh, becomes the host for all of its technology and the body pretty much stays the same. At the moment, um, our bodies can be spatially separated but electronically connected via the internet and so we can perform as extended operational systems, as distributed intelligences. So this is already happening to, to, a, to an extent. When I was exploring the physical and psychological parameters of the body, um, it became apparent very quickly how inadequate the biological body was and in fact, not only inadequate, but profoundly, profoundly obsolete. By obsolete, I don't mean that we can do without a body. Um, so it's not about getting rid of a body, but rather considering alternate sorts of embodiments um, so that um, uh, a body might operate and become aware in the world in very unexpected ways. So this obsolescence of the body uh, means interrogating this particular form and these particular functions and instead of considering them as, as a biological status quo, uh, considering how we might engineer uh, different cognitive and sensory experiences that will generate you know alternate paradigms of you know what it means to be human and what it means to to be a body you see I, I've never really really sort of separated these different modes of operation I mean, for me, the, the body has always uh, been not only a biological body, but an augmented machinic body, um, sometimes accelerated 100 kilometers an hour um, you know, to get here this morning, for example, um, but also uh, having, to, having to manage data, having to, to, to use information for this body, this body has always been, in addition to biological, 
a machinic body that has to function in, in, in virtual systems. I mean, that's who this body is, and that's what this body does, and this body performs as an extended operational system. Um, I mean, time zones are no longer mean, meaningful anymore. Um, we're functioning, uh, you know, beyond the normal kind of circadian rhythms of light and dark, um, of, of, of sort of hormonal, you know, metabolisms. Um, our, our bodies are, are functioning constantly um, and in extended uh, ways. Um, so we, we, we don't function, you know, in proximity anymore. Um, most of what we do, we do remotely and uh, we do electronically. Well, well I think um, open sims and, and, and for example um, Second Life, these are ways in which uh, you can inhabit and explore a, a virtual space. Uh, I think initially Second Life was just an impoverished first life but uh, perhaps we have to think of Second Life um, in, a, in a more extended sense and consider the possibilities of perhaps even constructing a third life. Um, in other words, instead of uh, uh, the human physically prompting uh, via a keyboard interface his avatar to to perform in Second Life. Imagine if your avatar was somewhat intelligent and autonomous enough to want to access a physical body and perform with it in the real world. So um, we would have not simply uh, human prompting of virtual entities but rather artificial intelligence being able to access my body as a surrogate body and perform an action in the real world. So uh, the feedback loops that we construct uh, will erase the necessity of making distinctions between the physical and the virtual. Um, it becomes one extended operational system that you slide between depending on the tasks that have to be performed. Sometimes those tasks are, are real-world tasks having to be performed in gravity with weight and friction and other times there'll be tasks that are performed in, 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 in the much smoother and speedier uh, realm of operation of the virtual. Yeah, well, Steve uh, did a lot of his interesting work as a student where he was basically kind of online 24 hours a day, um, or pretty much so. And so this idea of, 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 of where, you know, considering technology as, as wearables, you wear technology as much as you wear your clothing, and, and that technology provides... Um, an augmented uh, reality, um, one in which um, uh, one in which uh, allows your body to to perform both locally and globally um, all at once. Well, the, the internet is certainly an alternate space of operation. And, of course, uh, it's virtual in the sense that uh, you can perform and operate uh, and collaborate and interface uh, in ways that you can't ordinarily do um, uh, 
proximally and, and physically. Um, so the internet is simultaneously a, a physical system of computers and connections and wires and optic fibre cable and satellite systems and all that. Uh, but what it generates it is a, a virtual realm of operation. Virtual, um, to me, suggests uh, a space of operation where we can manage data streams that we can calculate and collaborate in ways that we couldn't before, that we can simulate and emulate and experiment in ways that we can't conveniently do in the physical, that's all. <laughs> well, the suspension events uh, occurred over a period of um, 13 years and um, I guess in retrospect they physically exhaust the body, they expose the body's inadequacies, its obsolescence its absence from its own agency and the fact that it often performs involuntarily. You know, the body was suspended um, in a multiplicity of, 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 of different locations, uh, in different positions, um, and I guess in the end there was nothing much more that you can say suspending your body. But I guess um, that idea of, of suspension becomes this sort of metaphor of being between the gravitational pull and, and the information thrust. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I, in fact, I was arrested in New York. <laughs> we did a suspension performance which we didn't get permission to do. It was over East 11th Street. Um, in East Village and uh, what was meant to be a 30-minute performance um, was terminated after about 12 minutes when the police sort of pulled me back in. We had locked the downstairs doors of the buildings but unfortunately they sort of broke in um, and, uh, and I was arrested uh, not for public nudity or for some S&M action but rather for being a danger to the public had I fallen on someone <laughs> and uh, yeah I had to appear in court the following uh, the following Monday well well the thing was that when they when the police pulled me back back in they, they demanded to see my ID uh, which was a bit difficult under the circumstances to produce <laughs> <laughs>